Morning all. I'd like to check out some games from the Caraco tournament in 1962. So this was the second World Championship qualifier which Fisher played in. And I want to show you the game against the mighty Tigran Petrosian. Tigran Petrosian is a player which perhaps we need more games on this channel. He after all successfully defended his World Championship title against Boris Spassky. And so had more than just the, the, the three years in office. And this was after the rematch clause was uh, removed by Fide. Botvinnik had the luxury of being able to get a rematch, but um, you know that, that was abolished. Um, and uh, if Petrosian had uh, lost against Spassky, he wouldn't have had that uh, luxury. But uh, yeah, he extended his reign as world champion for a full six Yes. So Tigran Petrosian, a Soviet Armenian grandmaster, world chess champion from 1963 to 69, nicknamed Iron Tigran due to his almost impenetrable defensive style, which emphasized safety above all else, a candidate for the World Chess Championship on eight occasions. So 1953, 56, 59, 1962, which is this Caraco we're going to look at, 1971, 74, 77, and 1980. He won the World Championship in 1963 against Mikhail Botvinnik, successfully defended it in 1966 against Spassky, and lost it then in 1969 to Spassky. Thus, he was the defending world champion or a world championship candidate in 10 consecutive three year cycles. He won the Soviet championship four times 1959, 61, 69, 75. He was recognized as the hardest player to beat in the history of chess by certain authors. So, e4 from Fischer. And what I find fascinating about this game is that the evolving Fischer, still quite uh, young at this time, uh, you know, perhaps needed to pick up uh, a greater strategic uh, understanding of the game. And you'll see why in this game there are certain moves which have a kind of clinical feel to them. But uh, against Iron Tigran, uh, there's a kind of strategic bear grip which is evident sometimes when they play each other. And Tigran chooses the French defence. So a, a strategic opening which really fits his style. Um, trying to avoid you know sharp technical variations, so we see d4, d5, knight c3, and not going into Fisher's you know winnower, but with bishop b4, you know e5, but playing knight f6, the classical, encouraging white to close the center, and we have here bishop g5, so white's not playing e5, but bishop g5, and this is the McCutcheon McCutcheon variation we're entering, bishop b4, so black counterpins. E5, H6, and this is an interesting bit of opening theory. You might be thinking that white can uh, take on F6 here. This this is fine uh, for black. This position, black's doing okay here after FG7. It looks a little bit dangerous, but Rook G8, and this has been played many times before. So if we go back to the game, actually Fisher, he retreats his bishop to D2, and now Tigran takes on C3. Fisher doesn't want double pawns here. He takes, well, Bishop takes c3. But here's the curiosity coming up. And why well, I'm particularly interested in showing you this game. After knight e4, guess what Fisher plays here? It looks to me a bit of a, an artificial looking move. Uh, so Fisher to play, a strange uh, move, I think. Strange looking. If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, Fisher plays Bishop A5. It looks quite curious as though immediate tempo gains, but Knight C6 does block in the C pawn. B6 does weaken some light squares, so it's a bit double edged. Both these things. For the moment, Tigran just castles. So Fisher's avoided double pawns for the moment. And it's got the option, of course, to go back to d2 if, say, b6. But we see bishop d3, and actually Tigran commits to knight c6 here, blocking in his own c pawn. Fisher doesn't mind the double pawns now after bishop c3, and Trojan takes that, doubling the pawns. And now, one of the perks of this knight c6 is pressure on these guys, and in fact, there's no need for c5. Black can undermine at the head of the pawn chain, not, not the exploitable base, but the head with f6, which he does. 
So you can get some counterplay quite often in the French defence along the F file. Fisher plays F4. And here, from an engine point of view, Black's already won the opening battle. Black's actually slightly better here from an engine point of view. Uh, so curiously, I mean, uh, the, I don't think there's too many games here. Uh, this this bishop a5, just, just before we go beyond this point, after knight e4, uh, the most common move is actually knight e2. There's also bishop b4 has been played quite a few times. Bishop d2 with 11 games. Bishop b4 with 32. But bishop a5, much rarer bird with three games. Okay, so just, just out of interest there. So anyway, we had that strange continuation with f6 here. So black's already starting to stand a bit better. f4, Trojan takes on e5. f takes e5. And now knight e7, this, this is quite powerful stuff. This f5 square is quite juicy for black here. Positioning, but also now c5, of course, black can carry on working on d4 now. Knight f3, c5 is played. White castles. Now queen a5, and some of us might be wary moving the queen over here to attack on the queen side with, with the king. But how can black, black's king safety be affected here? White hasn't really got the resources to mount a strong attack in this position, it would seem. But Fisher plays this sly, potentially sly attacking move, queen e1, not just protecting c3, but can can shift over perhaps uh, for menacing intentions. But this knight's covering some key light squares at the moment. So is it that dangerous? Bishop d7. And actually, this next move shows Fisher doesn't mind going into the end game. He plays c4, offering the exchange of queens. Black's done well still. Although white's, in theory, dissolving the double pawn, there are some other weaknesses which are potentially exploitable here. Trojan takes on e1. Rook f takes, d takes c4, which opens up this diagonal. And Fisher could have played bishop takes c4, uh, but I think black would be okay. So for example, b5, rook a c8, black's doing well. There's a nice grip on c4 here and d5. But rather, d5 is good for the knight, bishop c6 might be good for the bishop later. So in this position, actually, Fisher played bishop e4, which might actually be one of the very best moves. c takes d4, he's fracturing at least black's pawns, bishop takes b7, rook a b8, bishop a6. Okay, we see this pawn being protected for a moment with rook b4. But rook a d1, and there's a loose piece here. White's going to get his pawn back. At the moment, white is a pawn down. Tigran plays d3, giving it back like this. c takes, c takes, rook takes, and now to bishop c6. You can try and evaluate this position. It's equal on, on material. But look at this coordination, beautiful coordination on f3. Look at this knight, it's got some nice juicy squares. This rook's active as well. Black really hasn't got any peace problems to speak of. In fact, this d5 square is particularly comfortable to either perch the knight or the bishop. We see rook d4, rook takes d4, knight takes d4, bishop d5. The bishop does perch there, attacking the a2 pawn that moves. And now rook f4, black's got the pressure. Rook d1, white is having to cling on here. But the e5 pawn is weak, and it's often weak in the French defence if black can survive to the end game. So this e5, what to do about it? Bishop c8, counter-attacking. But this allows king f7. The king is useful in the end game, potentially here. Can it be harassed? Fisher's next move is actually a5. If he did try and harass the king, it might be fairly harmless. Well, actually, the knight drops. Impossible move. Pardon me. What can white do in this position? He played a5. Just dropping the e-pawn. How is white not actually losing material here after bishop c8? If we just rewind back here, was there a better move? g3. Rook goes to e4. Bishop f1. Is it a more favourable way of losing the pawn? 
possibly but still better for black okay so in the game it starts to go badly wrong here after bishop c8 king f7 so white's losing that center pawn but he's trying to do something of course with his a pawn here so knight takes e5 a6 rook g4 targeting g2 now that's protected knight c4 hitting the rook check king e7 knight b5 if white can get this a7 pawn then a6 is more dangerous knight d6 full king no bishop and knight knight takes d6 king takes d6 now bishop b7 is this rook and pawn ending just lost here because isn't this pawn going to be vulnerable what what could fisher do though he's been faced with king c7 as a threat here or is it actually not even king c7 no that's not the major threat rook c4 rook c4 that's a pretty nasty threat in this position so this this bishop is kind of run out of squares here it's kind of awkward on c8 so fisher does play bishop b7 after take take the king goes to munch the pawn it looked pretty dire this rook and pawn ending h3 the rook goes to g5 rook b2 blockade with king b8 king f2 rook d5 the rook is switching to win this pawn king e3 rook d7 king e4 two pawns down now rook f2 and here actually fisher resigned an interesting strategic game showing uh, tigran his his strength in in the french defense and this is not the only french defense game which he did well in in this tournament it's very interesting the use of the french defense by tigran petrosian hope you enjoyed it comments or questions on youtube thanks very much